and record this conversation um, for the number of students that are architectural students that are unable to join us. But I know we have a lot of students that are excited to listen and learn from you and ask questions. Um, I'll be uh, admitting uh, students and advisors that are still gonna be uh, probably trickling in here over the next few minutes. But I'm just so excited to have you each on the line. If we could start just by a little bit of introducing uh, each of our four panelists, if you'd be willing to share uh, where you're working um, and a little bit about your backstory. Uh, as I think students heard uh, right before we got started, really excited that all of our panelists know one another today. That it's a very tight knit community um, here in the Twin Cities. Um, so do we wanna go ahead and get started with introductions? Okay, well, Mo, you co you're coming out of your shelf, so why don't you begin? Uh, well, uh, good, 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 good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Mohamed Lawal. I am the principal architect and owner of Lawal Scott Erickson Architects located here in Minneapolis. My official title is one enigmatic composer. So over my left shoulder here, you can see that's a, a picture of architectural buildings shaped like musical instruments. And the team in my office say that I act as a composer trying to bring teams together to create something that's beautiful and harmonious. Um, backstory is uh, I graduated from the University of Minnesota with a Bachelor of Architecture degree. Um, and I started working for a, a firm in town in 1991. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of it. Oh, oh, that's right. It was Cunningham Architects uh, for a wonderful architect. Uh, he sat in the mezzanine and I sat in the space um, right, right below him. And he used to throw ping pong balls at me that would say, keep working. Uh, you're doing a great job. That's a great design. And I really learned about uh, collaborative consensus building design and have uh, um, used that as a basis for my practice uh, here in the Twin Cities. Um, I don't know if that's enough about me, but that's it. that's a little bit about uh, me. Okay, I can go next. I'm Nicole Bachnight. I graduated from Kansas State University in 2018 with my master's in architecture. I currently work at LSE Architects as a project designer, and I have been there since I graduated. I had two previous internships at LSE, um, an internship at Urban Works for one summer, and then two internships at PCL Construction prior to that. Excellent. Thank you. And John, would you mind introducing yourself as well? Okay, my name, my name is John Cunningham, and uh, I'm uh, a retired architect. I retired two years ago, October 1st, 2018, which was 50 years to the day that I started my practice. Started my practice October 1st, 1968. Uh, I was 28 years old, and I uh, thought it'd be fun to have my own practice. So uh, 50 years later, I retired. I am not currently practicing architecture. Uh, I am drawing and painting and doing some other things like talking to students in symposiums like this. Um, I, I taught at the University School of Architecture for 17 years from uh, 1967 to 1984. And uh, I was... Uh, I got my master's in architecture at Harvard University because in those days you had to have a master's to teach at the university. So I had a great time being an architect and it's a uh, profession that I love, still love. And uh, uh, I was very glad that I uh, was in that profession. Thank you. and. Uh... So I'm gonna uh, wanna get into in a couple of minutes, really talking about kind of the, the mentorship each of you have received as it's very unique that we have three panelists that have both been mentees and mentors for others on the call. But first I just wanna start by 
talking about where did you first get exposed into architecture? Where did that inspiration for you come from? Um, you know, the beginning of your careers, if you would each be willing to speak a little bit about that. I could jump right in there because one of my favorite stories is prior to going to the University of Minnesota and entering the School of Architecture, I had never met or talked to an architect to my knowledge. I never had an internship. I didn't know any architects. I now live in a house that my great-grandfather built in 1891. And I love this house. It's, uh, if blood is thicker than water, he, the ghost of my grandfather great-grandfather is running around this house. I lived with his daughter when I was a little boy and she used to refer to him as Papa. He built 140 houses. Uh, Mo would appreciate this. An architect who designed 140 houses would have a, quite a portfolio. My, my great-grandfather built 140 houses in wow. Minneapolis. 80 of them are still standing. I live in one of them. And a lot of them are on the National Historic Register. But I never met an architect. And I accidentally blundered into a course in my freshman year called Drawing for Pre-Architects. And I was in aeronautical engineering and I discovered there was too much physics, too much looking at wind tunnels. And I thought I'd be drawing cool planes. And they didn't draw any cool planes. They, draw, they drew airfoils all the time. And I was in wind tunnels and watching smoke go over airfoils. And I thought, this isn't what I planned on at all. I'd like to get in a course that had some drawing in it. So I took drawing for pre-architect and the rest is, the rest is history. It was something I, and the mentors, my biggest mentor happens to be coincidentally with one of most, a guy named Jim Stagerberg. And he loved this profession and he infected me with it. I mean, he, just, he took me under his wing. I never had, I never worked in an architectural office when I was in school. And he hired me right at my thesis there at the university, you'd make a thesis as your last project. And he came up to me afterwards and he said to me, he said to me, he said, I'd like to hire you if I could afford you. And I said, you can afford me, make me an offer. That's, I'm a really good negotiator. And, and so he said, okay, I can pay you $2.25 an hour. And I thought, well, gee, my buddy, Bill Pedersen just got $2.25 from Leonard Parker. That's pretty good wages. I think I'll take that. So I went to work for him for $2.25 an hour. And that was one of the best. If you said to me, what are the five best decisions in my life? Well, I picked my wife first, but that's a close second. Going to work for him for $2.25 an hour. You do the quick math, it's about 450 bucks a month. Well, you could live on that in those days. And not only you could live on that, you could get married and have kids on that. Um, and, uh, but it wasn't much, but uh, that was the best decision. He was my mentor, my, uh, he was almost more like a dad than a guy. He, he got me into graduate school. He got me a job teaching at the university, all sorts of things. He was really mad at me when I told him I was going to start my own practice. Gosh, he was, he was a very bitter man, but he got over it. And um, just like I, the way I felt about Muhammad when he left, you know, but uh, uh, it was, it was the greatest decision. I always tell students, don't worry about what you get paid, worry about where you work. That's the most important, especially when you're young. Worry about when you work. You want to work in the office you want to work in. It's not important what you get paid. It's more important where you're working. That is the best, one of the best advices. And internships are terrific. I never had an internship, but he invited me to work for him. And the rest is history. You want, you want to jump in, Nicole? I, yes, I can jump in with my story. Uh, so both of my parents are actually in the profession of architecture. So I grew up um, in an architecture office and many architecture offices. And I was lucky enough to grow up with a lot of mentors off the bat. I decided to go into architecture in seventh grade. Um, and that was a decision since I was 
exposed to it so much that I was either going to love it or I was going to hate it. And I ended up loving it. Um, and so uh, coincidentally, I actually, I now work with my mom and she has become one of my mentors as well as my dad. Um, but I've also had mentors like Mohammed, uh, like my godmom. She's also in the profession. Uh, so it, I've been blessed to have mentors that look like me. Um, you know, in, in our profession, it can be very, very um, uh, homogeneous. And so to have mentors that look like me that have shared similar experiences, um, I am striving to give that back uh, and mentor students in that same way, because I think that's very valuable to be able to go to your mentor and talk about similar experiences within the profession that you might not otherwise get. Nice. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, Nicole. Um, I never thought about being an architect. I wanted to be an artist. I was a very skilled painter, painter, not painting, but painter, fine artist, very skilled with markings and drawing and uh, um, very good in mathematics. My father um, had a PhD in mathematics. Uh, um, at the time we were living in Nigeria um, and I was uh, probably 15 there. Um, you get to skip grade. So I was in my senior year of high school um, and um, my dad <clears throat> asked me what vocation I was going to be. And I was like, oh, hey, I'm going to be an artist. And he said, nope, you're living in Nigeria. You have to pick a profession. And um, I was taking a technical drafting at the time. And I said, well, architecture is a profession. I'll, I'll, I'll study architecture. I'll apply for um, architecture as one of the courses I put, put in for, for college. And so I applied for architecture and got into the architecture program. And that's how I um, got into architecture. Um, I, was, uh, um, I had a, a professor that was from Canada and I was really skilled at, at, at drafting and technical drawing and uh, that's kind of how I got into it. My, my first love would be um, fine art um, and, and, and probably anything related to arts. But once I did get into architecture, um, my father unfortunately passed away before I graduated from high school. But that year where I said, I'm gonna study architecture, he started writing up uh, quadratic equations um, that if I solved them, they could turn into, and then I, they could turn into beautiful graphs. So he had a, a thing with the imaginary numbers and taking mathematics and why, writing quadratic equations that I could solve and create wonderful shapes and forms out of them if I solved them. So sort of critical thinking. Um, so, um, and like Nicole said, I'll, I'll just say in, in terms of introducing others to architecture as a a mentee in 1994, when I was working at John's office, um, um, we started a program called the Architectural Youth Program. It was to introduce minorities, women, and at-risk students to architecture and the design arts. Um, and we ran that program for close to 17 years um, and it introduced, used design as a tool to introduce over 450 high school students to architecture and the design arts. Um, so. But that's how I got into architecture. You know, it wasn't uh, something that was uh, intentional on my part. Um, it's certainly, um, it's something that I love. It's something that I do now. Um, but I, I combined, um, and, and I, I will say I, I've combined three things that were really important in my life. Um, my love of art, my love of mathematics, and my love of language, because my mother was an English teacher and poet. And so one of the things that um, we don't talk a lot about in architecture is the importance of communication, both your written and your verbal communication. So like a lot of us have drawings behind us, John has drawings behind him, but your ability to communicate verbally and written to your clients and colleagues is as important as your ability to communicate graphically. So. Uh, I, have a, I have a great story about that. Mohammed came along, and Ralph Rapson was the uh, was the uh, 
head of the school and retired in 1984. And um, people asked me how, why you were an architect. And I said, well, when I was in school, there were role models. And I would say Ralph Rapson was a role model. He drew beautifully. He had terrific ideas. And he and I collaborated about two years before he died. I would guess he was something like 91, 92 years old. And we got together on a project and we were working on a housing project bridging the freeway. It was 300 feet long and it was the Franklin Avenue Bridge over the freeway. And it looked downtown and it looked south. Very exciting project. The only thing is I didn't get to draw a line because Ralph is so fast. Every night he would, we'd talk together and he would go home and make another drawing. And I was busy doing some other things and I was hoping I could get my pencil in edgewise and he'd come with another drawing. And then we'd critique that drawing and the next morning he'd come with another drawing. Well, by the end of the week, we were, we were five layers deep into the project. I hadn't drawn a stroke. And Ralph says to me, John, that we're going to present it today. And I said, yeah, he said, you do the talking. And Ralph got fired from more projects than anybody I ever knew, because he used to get mad at the client when they didn't agree with him, rather than try to be persuasive. He'd just get mad. So we had a great time with the client and everything. But I'll never forget, John, you do the talking. And I was so taken about I hadn't drawn a line. And they, we had this whole pile of beautiful drawings and full color and everything like that. They looked terrific. <laughs> and, and, and I thought to myself, that was Ralph's missing element. He, was, he wasn't a talker. He was the, one of the most quiet guys, wonderful guy and a role model in every other way, but he wasn't a talker. So oh. what else would you like us to say? Yeah, thank you each for sharing about the the early inspiration kind of exposure of how you landed on this space. Would love to then know about, you know, once for our students on the line, once we have this interest in knowing, you know, where we want to go, how do we get there? So specifically, Nicole as well, um, who's, you know, just been through this journey, what what does it look like to both be getting experience, to be talking to professionals? What advice would you have for students um, that are looking to get connected into this space, you know, specifically before you've uh, completed your degree? So during college, I was actively involved in my um, NOMAS chapter, National Organization of Minority Architecture Students. And that was a great way uh, to not only start to form my community of uh, friends that I would take into the professional world, but also to get exposure to professionals while I was in college. We would invite professionals to come uh, and talk with us and, and speak with us uh, all the time. And it was also a great support network within where you could start bouncing off ideas um, and really just you know try and start to form that community. And I've taken that into my professional career. I currently serve on the um, AIA Minnesota board of directors and the MSP NOMA board as well. And so that's uh, a great, um, a great way to get involved professionally as well and kind of continue that, um, continue that volunteer and activism throughout your career. So I would highly recommend joining some sort of group because there is a whole world outside of uh, professional practice that you can dive into that uh, can really help support you in other ways that you might not get from just working in a firm. Thank you so much. I'm putting uh, Noma uh, the link in our chat bar. Uh, I believe there are specific chapters as well um, that students can get involved in. Um, that's a great recommendation. And Mo and John, what other advice should we be taking away? Uh, a lot of go ahead, students John. always ask me and I bet, I said, I, I think what I always, when I was hiring people, 
I always was looking for skills. And some people were blessed with a lot of skills, so it didn't like, take long for to recognize them in people like Muhammad. But the skills in architecture are very varied. There are people who are very, very detail oriented. And architects, architecture is filled with details, filled with, I mean, every everything in a building is chosen by the architect. The hardware, the lights, the carpeting, the flooring, everything. And I remember one of our administrators one time said to me, she said, I had no idea that, that you picked everything. And I said, well, who do you think does it? She, she said, I never thought of that. And I said, well, that's what we do. We pick everything. So there's, uh, somebody said one time, in, in the average house, there are 15,000 decisions in the house. Now, forget about it if you do a 13,000 seat auditorium with uh, fancy acoustics and communications. Um, so there, there, there are many, many decisions and, and most people are happy in architecture, like lots of them. And as, as Mo described, like synthesizing things, bringing them together, making them into recognizable packages, bringing all this complexity together. You have to like that idea, not getting, it's, it's sort of funny, attention to detail, but not getting bogged down in it and keeping all kinds of things in mind, making the possibilities as rich as possible. Now, I, if, I'll, I'll, uh, I, it, it's been, been a little while since I've uh, entered the profession, but if I were uh, a college student right now looking to enter the profession, I think uh, uh, something that I, I um, one, like Nicole said, uh, is, is about getting involved in your, or your school organizations. I'm getting involved in um, other community organizations. You know, there, there's things that, such as search for shelter or things that are, there, there are a lot of urban design community things where you can get input, give input. And, and through those, you, you create relationships. Um, in our practice, we talk about architecture um, being, you know, planting a seed and being a tree and every branch has leaves and you don't know each leaf is a relationship, right? And they all connect down into the major trunk. So make sure that you're, 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 you're out there. But then something I've always talked to folks that, that come to us, um, we get a lot of resumes and, and, and have discussions and Nicole can, can say if I say this or not, but we talk a lot about practice and, and practicing so that you are better at your trade. So if you live in Kansas or if you live in Boston, you live here in Minneapolis, you live in St. Paul. Um, if you bike, if you ride, um, if you walk or if you have a car, um, take a different route to school every day, take a different route to class every day. Be aware of your environment. Understand what it looks like, what a building looks like at 8 a.m. in the morning. Understand what it looks like at noon understand those things so that you get the emotional side of architecture, but you're also aware of buildings that are under construction, walk along construction sites. So when people come to me, one, like John said, I look for your skill and talent, right? But I also look for your awareness of your own city, your own surrounding, and how much practice you've done yourself. Are you practicing getting better? Um, I have a fun story for Nicole. You know, when Nicole started, my hair was black like hers and it was long like hers. Mm -hmm. And I, I can mm -hmm. see when I look to my left, I see John, I see where I'm going. In the next 30, I'll have even less gray hair and it'll be less long. So Nicole, as you look and as you guys all look, you'll look like Nicole, you'll look like me soon and then you'll be John later. Um, oh, you don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I said this. <laughs> yes, we had a thing with Nicole. Like when 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 she when she was working as an intern, um, we went to uh, um, two of our projects. One was a a project. It was a three hundred and twenty thousand square foot building that was under construction on Penn and Plymouth in North Minneapolis, and another one was an eight thousand square foot library that had recently opened. 
And I had a number of questions. I think I gave Nicole and the other intern that were working at our office a set of the working drawings. And when we got to the library, I asked Nicole, you know, or and or the other person, it was Danny. I don't know if you remember this. I said, yes. what is the exterior material of the building? It's like, oh, I don't know. Well, it was in the drawings. But as part of it, we were talking on site. And how many custom size granite panels were there on the library? Nicole should remember this. Or I would say, what's the size of the grid in the building? The job soup took us through. And so one of the things about practice that I had was we went out to see two projects that we had recent, one was we had recently completed, the other was under construction. But then what was important to me on our drive back was institutional knowledge. So all of a sudden there was a quiz in the drive back. What was the grid? What did the contractor say was some of the challenges? And this and that. So trying to recall your own work, trying to recall what you are doing so that when you are meeting with people and you meet with possible new relationships and or interviews, you're conversational and well-versed in the craft that you're moving forward in. So some of my thoughts about entry into the profession, um, being skilled, you know, Something else I would just I would just really suggest to folks at, 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 um, is to um, try as much as possible to document your work and write down what it is you've done. Keep some chronology or journal. Um, this year I applied for to be a fellow in the American Institute of Architects, and they they you know you have to summarize your thirty year career. Boy, um, if you don't have a good it, 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 it's it's it, it how much you forget how much you've done uh, so just remembering that because then you you continue to build on your your own experience as well yeah thank you i i think each of um what you all shared about i mean honing your craft of of practicing none of this comes naturally um it's all come you know from hard work and and practice intentionality. And you talked about, you know, exposure. I think that's really important. And then getting involved in the resources and the communities that we have around of us. Um, I think that's really uh, important. And it's just so clear talking to the three of you, what type of rapport that you have in the mentorship. Um, and so if we could spend a few minutes talking about both the importance in your career of having those mentors and being a mentor for others and what that's meant for you. Um, and specifically, what can our students um, who are looking for mentorship, how do they go about finding mentorship? Um, and then, you know, as they're in that mentoring relationship, what, what should they be looking for? What are the questions they should be asking? I, I have a client who, who owns a company and she's the CEO of the company. And she's, just an extraordinary woman and, and the job's down in Madison. She's been my client for 25 years. Now you might ask yourself why, first of all, she's very busy. She has a very, very, uh, she makes medical software and she invented it on her kitchen table for her husband who was a physician and his records were a mess. And she says, you know, honey, you could organize those a lot better. And he said, nah, no, nah, all medical records look like this. And in the old days, your file in a medical office was this thing with pink slips sticking out all over and post-it notes, and it was a mess. And uh, give you an interesting statistics, the average doctor has 2,000 patients. Think of that. How would he remember your name or your face? Or he or she. And so she started to organize it. Well, she now has the largest medical systems practice in the United States. She has 170 million patients in her software. And she said to me one time, she said, she said, I enjoy working with you because I trust you. And I realized that she says, you, may, you always make the decision based on my needs, not on your needs, not on whether you would 
what you want to happen, but what you think I want to happen. And then she said to me, your architecture sells my product, which I thought was really sort of weird because the architecture sold her medical software. And she would invite people and she would say, they would come and they would sign the contract before they left the campus. She said, I, I didn't intend it to be that way. They were so excited. Campus covers a thousand acres and it, she has 10,000 employees. When I started working for her, we had exactly the name, same number of employees. She had a hundred and I had a hundred. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice if we grew together? Well, I never got to 10,000. I never imagined it. In fact, I never imagined her at 10,000, but it's quite a campus. It covers a thousand acres and there are, uh, I lost track of how many buildings down there, but we've been working 25 years. And those two things, she trusted us and we sold her product. And somebody said, well, what is your mission? I said, our mission is to make our clients successful. Whether they come to us for a church or a house or a school or a medical software building and to try to figure out a way to make them be successful or happy or whatever it is that there is aim. And part of that is talking to them. Part of that is, is uh, listening very carefully. What is really, I, I remember talking to a house client and the, the man and the woman were telling me how they wanted it arranged. I said, don't tell me how you want to arrange. Tell me what you're going to do there. What are you going to do there? How do you entertain? What's your family gathering look like? What do you do in the evening? I want to know how you're going to, your activities in the house. Don't worry about where to put this or where to put that. And just tell me what you're going to do there. And it was a, it's, I guess that's what we're always asking. What are you going to do there? So, hey, hey, Matt, this is Muhammad. Um, John, always, you know, great, great stories. I remember, I think it's Judy, right? Epic. Judy, uh, yeah. Yep, 1991. Um, uh, mentors, you know, uh, finding mentors. One, uh, Nicole notes, uh, looking at your local student organizations. Um, but there are a few things that I, I also believe in, in mentorship for me personally is that I, I, I think you should look to have multiple mentors in multiple locations. Um, and uh, I, uh, um, you know, um, so um, I, I think that you, um, so you're going to have to have multiple mentors. I, I think that, that that's one thing. Um, I think that there are a number of organizations such as AIA that has a list, the American Institute of Architects, that has a, a, um, a link or, or NOMA to mentors that are um, in different areas of the profession, whether it's sustainability, whether it's just uh, in architecture in general, or if you're looking for a man, a woman, someone of diversity, um, you're looking at their practice, like John talked about the type of work, where you work, um, their work interests you. Um, something else that I've found, um, for me, it's a little bit uh, different today, um, and, and Nicole maybe can talk to that, but, but when I was in the profession, um, you know, I walked around a lot, and I actually walked into particular offices to meet individuals that I wanted to meet, and I didn't take no for an answer. Um, I was a, a pest, and so I would continue to call and say, I'd like to talk to you about how you did this. And, and at some point, um, someone would return your call and I would go to lunches. Um, I had the good fortune. I'll, I'll say a few stories is, is, is just being there and being aware and being around if you have the opportunity. Um, Bill, um, John Cunningham mentioned uh, Bill Pedersen. Um, some of you guys may not know, or some of you may not know Bill Pedersen. Um, he's the founder, one of the founders of Cohn, Pedersen, Fox, one of the highly accomplished architectural firms in the United States and in the world, um, known for tall high-rise buildings. He was a classmate of John Cunningham's. 
as a 27 year old architect, I happened to be at, at the AIA convention sitting around some architects talking and one of them said, hey, Bill, do you wanna go out to dinner? And Bill was like, sure, we'll go out to dinner after the convention. And I said, hey, John, do you mind if I tag along? I was like, hey, come on. And so here I am at dinner with John Cunningham, Bill Pedersen, Ed Codet, and they're talking about the practice. And I just sat there and took notes. Um, Robert Trayman Coles, who passed away, he's a fellow. He won the Roach Traveling Fellowship. Um, I think he says before Jim Stagerberg, um, he's an African-American architect. He, I think, attended the University of Minnesota, has a practice in Buffalo, New York. Um, he would come to town and be parts of panels and discussion. And I would go up to the panel afterwards and introduce myself. And then all of a sudden folks are like going to breakfast and I would just tag along, you know, um, and, and, and be part of their conversations. Um, Amy Ryan, who is uh, the head of, formerly head of um, Minneapolis Public Library, Hennepin County Library, I would tag along to community events. And at things like that, you tend to find people that may have similar interests, differing opinions, differing interests, but then you can find mentors um, that you can relate to and build relationships with. And I say to interns, I say to um, young college students and high school students that every relationship is mutually beneficial. As someone that's 50 years old, Nicole, don't tell them I'm 53. Um, I, have, um, I have a lot to learn from someone like Nicole, right? About, am I being a good leader? Am I putting you in a position to succeed, right? Are you getting the types of things that you need from our office? How are you doing personally, right? She can teach me a lot about what her generation is doing. I talk to folks like John, I learn about different things. So every relationship as a mentor or a mentee I think we should understand that it's mutually beneficial. You as a college student trying to get into architecture and trying to get into the profession have a lot to offer. And so when you go looking for mentors, also know that you bring a lot to the table. And when you're ready to bring what you have to the table, your mentors will also appear they will be obvious to you. It's not a one-way discussion, in other words. Some of my thoughts on mentorship. <laughs> Absolutely. So I will say the one benefit about everything being virtual these days is you can attend so many more events than you would otherwise have. So go to all those lectures, go to com virtual conferences, go to community meetings in your neighborhood, uh, start to be a presence and show up and so people start to get some name recognition of you you know get to get to know them so that way you can get the confidence to make a formal introduction and say hey are, are you willing to have a conversation with me um, I've had several people reach out to me on LinkedIn um, that's another way you can you can do it so there are still ways that you can connect um, and kind of get familiar with people who you think you might uh, want to have as a mentor. And I will also echo uh, the importance of having multiple mentors and different types of mentors. I have mentors that look like me. I have mentors that don't look like me. I have mentors that are not in the profession of architecture, but I can still gain insight that is um, beneficial to me personally and might be beneficial to my career later on. So don't be afraid to uh, branch out into other areas of interest in your life and also get mentors that can um, feed uh, other passions of yours. I don't like the electronic stuff because we don't <laughs> see your infectious laugh in the office, but it, you know, that's where we are today. <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> I love it uh, so much for all sharing that advice. And I think especially important is just emphasizing the fact that the mentorships, that connecting, that 
that starting that conversation is mutually beneficial because I think too often there's the uncomfortableness of putting ourselves out there and initiating conversation and just being confident of knowing, you know, each of our students, you're bringing something to the table. Um, and so, you know, really take advantage of opportunities. Our three panelists right now are giving of their time because they care about you and they are investing in your future. Um, so with that said, do we have any questions um, from our students on the line? Otherwise, I am happy to continue to go through our questions. Yeah, and if you would uh, like to unmute yourself uh, and ask that, otherwise I can uh, read it off the chat bar as well. Okay, I was actually going to ask, sorry, um, I was actually going to ask if I could unmute myself, but um, one of my questions is, because I am a student leader, um, I go to Prairie View a and University, and I am the um, event coordinator for the AIS chapter here, and one thing that we've actually been having trouble with is actually getting students more engaged as far as um, virtual events and fairs and activities. Um, and also as far as trying to do um, check-ins as well for architecture students. So I think um, my, like my full question is, um, as like professionals in the field, how has like the pandemic affected you guys and how you guys are able to communicate with either your mentees or um, other um, students that are interested in being interns at your firm? Well, I, it's funny that I would jump in the quickest here. It's funny with, with, with the pandemic, it's actually made me more accessible because mm -hmm. a guy like Matt can dream up this meeting, ask me to attend it, I don't have any travel time. I don't even have to put on a coat and I can sit here and, and meet with as many people as possible. So in an odd way, the other day I spent 10 hours in meetings like this. And it occurred to me that I, in a lot of ways I'm more accessible than I was pre-pandemic because I didn't have many Zoom meetings like this. Now, now I have them all the time. And when Mo and I were first talking about this, I said, wouldn't it be neat if we could get students in high school and in college and just periodically we'd meet with them and shoot the breeze? Gee, I'm working on this and you know, what do I need to know or what do I need to do? Sort of have a check-in where they could ask questions or ask for assistance or opinions or things like that. And I said, I'd be perfectly willing to do that. And, and I think that he would too, and in terms of, and it doesn't matter what, whether getting a job or how to get involved in the community or, you know, and I think for both, I, I mean, I would have been terrified as a student to ask questions. I, I wasn't a student who asked a lot of questions. I just sat there in the back and was very quiet. It's hard to imagine, but I did, but I, I, uh, I, I wasn't the outgoing reaching out student. So I understand being shy and not being able to do it. And whether that takes a smaller meeting or whether that takes a uh, intermediary so that they introduce somebody or something like that. But I was thinking that what was so great about this meeting, Matt, is that you made it happen and connected us. Absolutely. I, I have also been having plenty of Zoom and team chats with mentors. Um, and part of my NOMA involvement is we've been having uh, chats and check-ins with the uh, NOMAS Dunwoody chapter here in Minneapolis. Um, and so students come to that and some of them are, are more formal and some of them are more relaxed and just, you know, hey, how are you doing? How is studio going? Um, so I, I would agree uh, being virtual has made it more accessible to have, you know, coffee check-ins uh, or nightly check-ins or other weekend events where, yeah, you don't have to travel. And that's been great. 
we could even, Matt, we could even, I could suggest we could do it periodically. Like you could say, well, let's do it on the third Thursday or something like that. And it's, it's a fairly low expenditure of time. It's very accessible and people could show up if they wanted to. And they could sign up ahead of a time so whether we knew whether it was worth doing, if you know what I mean. And, um, but I think that it, because one of the things I realize now is if there were people said, oh, gee, I'd like to find an internship, mm -hmm. I could make three phone calls to offices and see if they were looking for interns. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. I happen to know that my office just got very busy with a great big project. So they're out looking right now. Awesome. I shouldn't uh, let that drop, should I? <laughs> no, <laughs> of course you should. <laughs> um, and I do have um, a last sneak in question. Um, how comfortable are you guys with um, receiving emails or even um, consistent communication with students that are interested in learning about the profession on a deeper scale rather than being, because it like, Currently during the pandemic, it's kind of hard being a studio, like working in studio through online and not being able to be in person and speaking with your professor and having them redline every, everything then and there. You have to like wait and everything gets prolonged. It's really stressful. But um, how comfortable are you guys um, with students contacting you through either your email or even through the, um, the firm's website? about um, either future positions or just independently looking for a mentor to review the resume or projects and things of that sort. Well, speaking, speaking for myself, I'd, I'd be comfortable with that. You're talking about directly? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. I sort of assumed that might be the end of, mm -hmm. uh, uh, of the meeting. And I, you know, Matt, I would say you can give my email, you have my email and my phone number, I believe. You can give my email and if a student wants to talk, I'd be happy to, to talk to them. I mean, we, we are, um, I know I am always open and accessible, um, you know, but, but sometimes time is a limiting factor where I'm not able to get to um, every email. And, and, and I try to, but but um, if you send an email, um, if I can't get to it, I always at least try to connect it to someone else in the office that may be able to follow up in some manner. Um, I think that what you'll find about architecture, just like any profession that you're getting into, um, persistence is important. Um, and the ability to know that this is what you want to do and so you have to pursue it. And I think that um, you never surrender your career or your success to anyone else. And so you continue to follow up and you continue to pursue it. Um, and I know that uh, um, I've made myself available at sometimes different times. I had a student that called me up for a number of times and she needed some hours and um, eventually it was like, hey, listen, I'm working Sunday, this Sunday from eight to seven, and I got a bunch to do. Um, and it's like NFL Sunday, but, and she came into the office, I was here, I had a whole series of programs that she could do on her own while I was working. We went to lunch, we went out to some construction sites that I had to go visit, um, but it was a Sunday. Um, I've done that Friday evenings with folks too. Um, so sometimes the time that you um, utilize for, for play um, may be a time for work, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, but it's practice too. So um, you, can, you can share my contact and, and Nicole um, as well, um, and we follow up. I, so I have to understand though, how do you pronounce your last name? It's Ajololo. Okay, um, is it Nigerian? No. no, the origins of it is Ghanaian. Um, but my family, <laughs> oh, right. my family um, is Ivorian. So okay. um, yeah, I'm, I'm Ivorian, but the origins of my last name derive from um, Ghana. I was just in Cote d'Ivoire um, uh, two years ago, Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire. Oh, okay, that's and, awesome. Uh, 
uh, Abidjan, spent some time in Abidjan and Yamsukuro. Okay. Yes. Oh, yes. And, uh, I was going to Accra mm -hmm. and, uh, in Ghana and I, 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 cu I couldn't make it. I got stuck. But uh, yeah, it's so always, Ghana, it's always you know, there. We actually had David Ajay here. Um, oh, he, you know, um, he came actually interviewed for a project with us. So I went and visited oh. his office in in London, you know, uh, yeah. he moved his family to Ghana now. So Cote d'Ivoire is amazing. One of the fastest growing economies, you know, it's, it's, yeah. Nigeria is Africa's most populous nation. So it is, I mean, but it's, it's, you know. it's still, <laughs> we're still there. We're still there. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Thank you. That's really awesome. So yeah, Matt, you can also share uh, my email as well. And to answer the question about the NOMAS chapter at the U of M, um, the last I heard is that they had decided not to create a NOMAS chapter, but to go for something more general and incorporate um, all the different departments at the U. Um, and I believe Chris um, Schilting has been kind of the coordinator in contact. I know he's a student um, counselor advisor there. So he would um, have more info, but uh, feel free whoever asked that question. I apologize, I, I don't know, but you can email and, and I can help follow up with that as well. Awesome. Thank you so much for all uh, the willingness to share contact information for the follow-up resource at the U uh, for that chapter. One of the other questions that came in um, was we talked a lot about collaborative work and if you would uh, briefly share just what some of your best memories have been working together with other architects. Ooh. You know, it's interesting. In, in terms of my own firm, which when I left, it was about 320 people. So there were a lot of architects to work with. And that was one of my greatest pleasures. I really, as I said a few years ago, I, I don't think I ever did much alone. Uh, it was always in collaboration with other people. And it, it's, it's funny because as a student, you're almost universally doing your own work. You're working by yourself. And then when you get into practice, you're almost never working by yourself. Maybe you could start your own practice and do houses and then you work by yourself. But Even normally you're not working by yourself because you have yeah, <laughs> yeah, but you're, you're hardly ever working. By, and for me, that was a pleasure. For me, that was a, I, uh, I, I feed off the people around me and I get a great pleasure out of working with other people. And uh, so for, for me, that worked just fine. Um, and so the bigger the, the bigger the party got, the better I liked it. Um, yeah, go ahead. You know, I, I, I agree with you, John, a, a lot. And, and, and I, I would say that one of the biggest myths in architecture is that it's uh, the Howard Rourke myth, yeah. which is a singular person that's coming up with this thing independently and it's gonna solve your life's problems and Frank Lloyd Wright. Architecture is a collaborative process in and of itself. And there are singular right? You can lead things, but it is collaborative. You're working with contractors, you're working with owners, you're working with educators, you're working with all kinds of people, you're working with poets. And I had, um, so collaboration and the ability, I think, to be vulnerable and share your ideas is fundamental to what we do. Um, in the back space in my office here, I have over 55 sketch pads that have sketches of just about every project that I have had the opportunity to work on in my career. The last 10 years, I, I don't do as much sketching as I used to. And I remember collaborating with uh, um, another architect um, a, a number of years ago, and I brought out my sketch pad once and I said, oh, here's, here's an idea that I have, you know, oh, here's an, here's a, an idea. And the architect said, you know, Mohammed, those ideas in your sketch pad don't have much value 
if you're not willing to share them with others on the team or around you, right? So that we can all talk about them, right? Share and learn and develop together. I don't know if you remember who that architect was, John. Um, but, you know, Are so- you attacking me again? <laughs> I am. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but but I think that that's true. So I've had some so 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 some wonderful collaborations, and collaboration is not me convincing you that my idea is the best idea, right? Collaboration is a process of us as a team trying to solicit and find the best idea that answers, right? the challenge or opportunity that our client has. So I'll, I'll say a couple of collaborations that, that we've had that were pretty exciting. Um, one, we were the local architects that oversaw construction on the US Bank Stadium, um, the, uh, um, the, the, the home of the Minnesota Vikings. So 36 months where HKS was the architect out of Dallas that designed the building. There was a, another firm that did some of the working drawings. Our job was to oversee construction for 36 months. So was to try to figure out how to translate and work with the contractor Mortensen on the drawings that had been developed and oversee construction for a project that we didn't get to design. That was a pretty exciting um, uh, collaboration because of the size and sheer scale of the project, this project type that we didn't think we were familiar with and that we didn't know about. Um, another really exciting collaboration um, that, 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 that we had when I first started the practice, um, we did an addition to the McNamara Alumni Center at the University of Minnesota. At the time, um, we had teamed up with Antoine Pradock and we did a, a canopy addition. It was, a it was my first project. It was a 110 square foot addition to the McNamara Alumni Center and Pradoc was the design architect. And I, you know, I had, you guys know Antoine Pradoc. I had to get these design drawings from Antoine Pradoc and said, here's where the light should go. And I'm like, I, I think at this point in my career, after practicing for 20 years, I could figure out how to do a triangular addition to the McNamara Alumni Center. But it was kind of, it was a neat, um, it was a small scale collaboration. Um, but it was really fun because Antoine at that point had been practicing for 30, 40 years, and he was as into this 110 square foot canopy addition to the McNamara Center as he was into when we were designing the building when we first did it. And so his love of architecture um, has maintained all the way through to current collaborations we're, we're trying to do with uh, um, folks. So those are two for me. I don't know, Nicole, do you have any? Uh, I, just, I have some fond memories of uh, collaborating with teachers and educators, you know, doing charrettes for the five elementary schools I've designed thus far in my career. And um, it's always great to go and interact directly with the end users uh, and to incorporate uh, their thoughts and opinions into the project as best you can. I'm just going to say for all you students out there, you know, I, I've been hoping Nicole's going to at one point say, you know, she likes collaborating with Muhammad and working with him. And, <laughs> you know, he brings a lot of energy to the office and everything, but, you know. <laughs> Way to go, Nicole, you know, don't let him do that. Don't give in to the pressure. Me too, you know. <laughs> Uh, I, I love it. Thank you each um, so, so much for sharing. I am cognizant of the time that it's one o'clock um, and so appreciative of you sharing um, with each of us today. Uh, if you have just any final words of advice uh, for our students, I think that would be a great way to close it out. We have email. So uh, for our students on the line, and then also we record these conversations. So for our students that were not able to be here today, we'll still be able to watch this and receive uh, contact information. Um, but yeah, we'd just love to know any final advice. Um, the story I wanted to tell is this woman who owns this big company in Madison. She has 
a plaque on her wall. She has lots of plaques on her wall about sayings. And one of the sayings is, every time somebody asks you to do something, do the best job you can, even if it's only getting a cup of coffee. That's the best advice I can give you. Every time somebody asks you to do something, do the best job you can. There's no such thing as junk work or, gee, that's beneath my dignity. Even if it's just get a, get a cup of coffee, do the best job you can. That would be the advice I would leave you. I will. Um, thanks, John. I, and and I, 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 um, I, that's, that's a wonderful piece of advice that I, I, I know that, 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 that I follow myself. I have four little sayings on my wall here. I'm a basketball fan. That's Michael Jordan over my right-hand side as a freshman at North Carolina, University of North Carolina, hitting the game-winning shot for the national championship in 1983. And, um, his experience as a freshman, a freshman doesn't take that shot, but he took the shot and they won the national championship and that was designed for him to take and make. Um, I have a couple of sayings um, on my wall here. One is be bold, it's that simple. Um, so dare to be bold. Um, a basketball one, the more shots you take, the more you make, right? Um, and that's very simple. It doesn't matter if you're shooting 50%, but the more shots you take, the more you make. So pursue it. Expect to win every time. It doesn't mean you're going to win, but expect to win. Go in positive and get after it. You miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. So any opportunity that's there, like John says, whether it's to design a bathroom, to design a garbage enclosure, to design a new school, hospital, house. Think about the opportunity that's in front of you and make the most of your time. Um, that's probably my most important one is make the most of your time. Um, what we've all found this year is that your time is precious um, and uh, things change and we have to adapt. And so make the most of your time. I think I talked about this earlier. Practice what you're doing. Um, love what you're doing and, and you'll get better at it. But, you know, make the most of your time. Um, and uh, you, you guys all have a bright future ahead of you um, and pursue it with a, a reckless abandon. Yeah, so I'll say um, be assertive, figure out what you want to do, surround yourself with the people who are going to help you get there, uh, and make the moves that are going to get you to where you want to be. Um, and don't let your mindset or anybody else get in the way of that. Um, and don't be discouraged with uh, the climate of COVID. There are still great things happening in our profession, uh, and you uh, will definitely be a valued asset when you graduate. Thank you guys so much. I have to actually run to another meeting, but thank you all three of you, all four of you guys for having this panel and for discussing and for sharing all of your wise wisdom and experience in the architectural field in Minnesota. Um, hopefully I'd be able to get to work with you guys in the future. <laughs> but You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Nicole. And, and Matt, thank you for uh, hosting and uh, um, having us all here share some of our experiences with you and, and everyone with the Wallen Foundation here. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think our architects are really the, the visionaries and the designers, you know, that create possibilities. And so I'm just so appreciative of the time we've got to spend today. We have contact information available for students that want to follow up. And as we talked about, Make the most of your time. You, you spent an hour today furthering your career possibilities. So that's great for our students, for our panelists. Thank you. And have a great Friday and a, a great weekend, everyone. Right. Thanks. Great to see you, Matt. Good to see you, Mo, and you too, Nicole.
You too. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Nicole. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.